Welcome to the Margie and Lisa show. I'm Margie Wigan, and Lisa is not here this evening. Um, so we have John Ritz here, who's usually behind the scenes and the um, in the booth, giving us instruction and phone calls. Um, so welcome, John. Glad to be here. I'm usually back there yelling things out, so <laughs> I figured to put me in front of the microphone tonight. Thank you. So what happened was when we were talking about tonight's segments, John had a lot to say about them. <laughs> so we convinced him that it would be better if he was in front of the camera. So that's great. So the first thing we're going to talk about tonight is our Hopkinton's trails. So one of the things that a lot of people come here for is the trails and the wonderful um, wildlife and getting mm -hmm. out there. And um, I know Dave Goldman for many years was Hopkinton Area Land Trust yep. and many Eagle projects went into mm -hmm. fixing up the trails. Mm -hmm. But you are actually on the I'm trails committee. The hop well, not a trails committee. Oh, what is it called? There is long well thank I'm you try go to make ahead. the store not plenty too long. of time go ahead i am with the hopkinton trails club yeah. which is just a volunteer group of citizens that like the trails oh. um and we want to get people out to use the trail what people don't realize is that we've got a lot of trails here in hopkinton we've got um, like 22 named trail systems in town mm -hmm. um, we have areas there's an area right near my house that got me into it um, 250 acres of land and I I'm out there all the time hardly ever see anybody out there so we want to get people to use the trails we do um, a hike about once a month and huh. a comment we almost always get every month people will say I didn't know this trail was here or I I've seen this trail I drive by it um, and I've always wondered where this trail went or I've always wanted to walk that so that's what we do we are not a hiking club um, we are a trails advocacy group. Mm -hmm. So oh, nice. we show people the existing trails, but we also will work with the town, we'll work with developers, um, we work with legacy farms. Um, we push them to say, as part of this, put in some trails and could we have some Thank land you. and that sort of thing. That's great. So um, how do people find information on this? Do you guys have any kind of... Oh, we're wicked easy. If you do a Google search on Hopkinton Trails, we are the first hit you're going to get. And we've okay. got... A Facebook page we've got a Twitter account which hardly anybody subscribes to yeah. um, but we've got our website we have an email list with well over 200 people on it oh great I but, need to um, I'm not on that list I didn't oh you should I uh, know I should I didn't I value the trails and I value the the open space um, and I know Lisa Jackson is on that yeah. right now Lisa started the trails club years oh, ago yay. and when you said the Thanks, trails Lisa. committee that's sort of how this started Lisa was interested in um, she went to the town and said, I'm interested in doing things with the trails. Um, who's in charge of the trails? And the town said, nobody. Oh. So they started to put together a trails committee. It got all mm -hmm. bogged up in a lot of red tape and paperwork. And Lisa being Lisa said, fine, you do that. Um, but I'm going to form a trails club because I just want to get out and start walking on the trails. Right, so. and well, she also has horses or and had she, a horse, so was her, her interest reason. is is having horses be able to yep. move through yep. the um, the forest. But oh, we've been going for uh, I think 12, 13 years now. Yeah, um, so it's the trails club is for is 12, 14 years. That's yep. awesome. Yep. So it's so people just have to Google Hopkinton Trails Club. Yep. Okay. Now now there is interest in a committee. Um, there is a, I'll say, there is a trail committee in town, but that's for the Upper Charles Trail. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And people know about that from Milford. Right. Um, the Milford Bike Path is part of the Upper Charles Trail. The entire Upper Charles Trail is a loop through Milford, Hopkinton, Ashland, um, Holliston, and mm -hmm. a little section in Sherburn. Mm -hmm. And all told it's about 25 26 miles okay. once it's finally built out so someone could run a marathon on someone the trail could run a marathon oh or you can get a get onto it Cross on your country. bike and you could you know spend two three hours and be yeah. right back where you started which would be great that is great i thought um i thought i heard as part of legacy and um just the talk about the trail the upper charles trail that there is a connection issue that I, I'm not mm -hmm. not sure that it connects all the way through. Well, there are a bunch of connections. So the the concept for the Upper Charles Trail came because um, it's abandoned railroad tracks yeah. that were there. Rail trail. And people said, oh, we'll just follow that. Uh -huh. So Milford was able to do, do that. Um, right. And away. they made a nice paved trail. Yeah. Theirs actually goes in two, sec two directions. One direction comes 
up toward Hopkinton, and that's the section that everybody knows yep. down off Hayden Road. The other section heads toward Holliston. Right. And they're kind of the, the turning point in the trail. Uh-huh. Um, so when you cross Route 85, yep. just before you get to 495, that heads towards Hopkinton on the left side, mm -hmm. and then it heads towards Milford. Right. Where does it head toward Holliston? Um, sort of down in Mil oh. Milford Center, there's a, a the, what's down there? Um, there's a couple of drug stores on, on Route 16. Okay, so it's Route 16. And in there, but yeah, it's somewhere in there, um, sort of by the old Kmart. Okay. Um, is kind of where it comes out. So it's, it's between all those couple of roads in there. Mm -hmm. it, it, oh, yes, I know where that it's is. It's between By them. that hotel? Yep. Yeah, okay. And it comes out there and goes and heads toward right. Holliston. Right. So, so, Hop, so Milford was able to acquire most of their railroad bed. Hmm. Um, they had no problems. Well, I shouldn't say they had no problems, but most of their trail is on the old bed. Um, in Hopkinton, the old railroad bed got sold off, and it's people's backyards, it's people's hmm. driveways. Um, How could it be sold off? Who did it belong to originally? I don't, whatever the railroad company was. Okay. And I think it ended up in, I want to say in the 19... Uh, 50s the last um, tracks were pulled up okay so you know the center trail is one section of it and that's a very obvious railroad oh, trail okay and it goes right down along Hayden Row and you can see yeah. um, you can see bits and pieces of it and the new echo trail um, off uh, Granite Street okay um, that the town just bought a couple years ago mm -hmm. uh, from Betty Wyckoff that's another section of it Okay. And that almost goes all the way out to the Milford thing. I can see that connecting, yeah. and because there's a lake back in there, Echo yes, Lake. Yes, Echo Lake, which is the the Comes source of the Charles River. Amazing. So so it goes from Granite Street. Does it go around the lake and hooks into? No. Nope. So it goes on the left. Um, literally, it goes between um, Hayden Row and the lake. Yeah. So it goes in there. But on the other side of Granite Street, going up through Charles View. It's all been taken over by um, private, it's all private property now. Okay, and I think that was part of the chamberlain Whalen connection conversation. Because mm -hmm. some of the roads, the, some right. of the properties in there are part of that, correct? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it goes up, so just continuing to see if I can finish this off. Yeah. Um, the route is it goes up through there, goes through Hopkins School, or right yep. next to Hopkins School, mm -hmm. follows the center trail, mm -hmm. goes across the street by um, Hopkinton Lumber, mm -hmm. and then takes a sharp turn and goes behind um, the senior center. Okay. And then go, and then now st starts to head toward Ashland. Oh. Then it crosses under um, East Main Street. How could it cross under me? There was a tunnel there, and it's been still? filled in. The tunnel is still there. It's been filled in with rock. But it, it went right under that section where um, that washed out a few years ago that they put in the new guardrail and it's by the uh, just past the stone house just down the hill um, sort of at the bottom of the hill from that the marathoners have to deal with at the beginning right at the bottom of that hill is where it crossed under and then it goes on the other side and now it's going up through legacy and it goes up it crosses clinton street and it heads toward so is Ashland. it near prestwick and wilson yep so can and there's a, there are sections of it in there that are still perfectly walkable. So and can they beautiful. cut through again and make it go under? Well, That's no, kind of fun. they won't make it oh, cut through. But fine. so the challenge, so those are all the sections um, in Hopkinton. Ashland has just started working on their section of the trail. Cool. Um, and they've had a couple of public meetings. Our Upper Charles Trail Committee in Hopkinton, the big. Um, issue is that because so much of the land has been purchased mm -hmm. we can't just go on the rail trail anymore oh. um, they have to find other routes so because it's yeah and you get a lot of not in my backyard uh, and course. people want it so it it's quite the challenge for them to figure out and they're i know a lot of people on that committee and they're all working hard to yeah. they, they're putting out different proposals it could go here it could go here um, one thing they want to make sure it does is goes through downtown Hopkinton so that all these lovely bikers that are coming to visit mm -hmm. now will stop for a cup of coffee or some desserts so or that, something. Good. So we want to bring business, use this to bring business into town. Right. So the bike trail becomes, the Main Street bike trail becomes part of that mm -hmm. connection from Hopkinton to yeah. Ashland. So how, 
does the bike trail work in your mind? Because we talked a little bit about the bike yeah. trail, and I heard three different suggestions of ways to have the bike trail. Mm -hmm. um, one was having a two-way thing on Route 85, yep. and one was having um, sidewalk, curb, bike, curb, car. Yeah, that's... Right? I, I heard that. I heard all of that. And, and then, that, car, so there's yeah. another one with the curb somewhere else, and I just... It, yeah, I, I don't. I'd have and to. And do we have enough room them. for that on our road? It doesn't well, look they, like. Well, they they will have room, but okay. you know that is, I was going to bring that up because at that downtown revitalization talk, there was a lot of people were like, "Why do you have to put bike lanes in there?" And it's part of the budget, are, they, the grant. Yeah, you know, and it's a bike lane to nowhere. But I was in the back of that room saying, "No, it's not a bike lane to nowhere. That's actually going to be part of the Upper Charles Trail." Thank through, you through Hopkinton. Thank you for clarifying. That's that little section. It's not a, a trail to nowhere. Yeah, yeah the curbs, um, I thought the marathon people had very legitimate concerns about having two steps of uh, curbs and the runners. It, totally. That having, I used to nervous. be a runner and I know what the starts are like and yeah. you're not looking at your feet or of the ground. You're just surrounded by bodies. So I don't yeah, know. Yeah, and, and you have to jostle your way through that first part. Yeah. So I. I just you already have enough to deal right. with upper body jostling right. and then feet and ankles and I that sounds yeah, dangerous I don't to know me. how they're gonna do that we'll have to they've done a lot of them is I guess the best I can say is the people that design this have done they many don't have of these marathons where they have bike no trails. that's gonna be a new twist so for them. that's they're gonna piece. have to work that out maybe in the marathon section they would do something else we'll see maybe have those little ridgy bumps yeah. light up things don't know, you know but back to trails so the reason all of this talking about this upper charles trail there is interest the people that are on the upper charles trail committee are getting questions from people about other trails mm. and saying um you know can you uh build our a tr we have a trail here and where is this going to go and how is this going to and can you fix this up and they were getting so many of those they approached the selectmen and said we think we need, back to Lisa Jackson's original yes, question, yes. we think we need a trail committee yes. in town, a group, someone yes. that is responsible for the trails in town to um, take reports of needs for maintenance or right. a request to build a new trail mm -hmm. and get the proper resources built out for that. And even handing some things off to Boy Scouts, say, Right. You know, we've got a list of projects. You're a scout. Well, see, that's what this. I was going to say because Hopkinton Area Land Trust has functioned in that capacity. Jeff Ferber, Some. Dave Goldman have been people who have contacted me as Eagle Scout mentor yep. to say, do you have any scouts? We want to fix the trail coming off of Cross Street. Yep. We want to fix the trail on the other side of Cross Street, you know, mm. and that connects over by TJ's. Right. I know those have been two projects. We There was a trail over by... Um, Fruit Street Fields. Mm -hmm. They worked on. There's a trail over by Lake Whitehall. Yep. So all those little pieces seem to have been part of the Halt Hopkinton well, Area Halt, Land Trust. Halt is, you know, they're more of a property group. Yeah. They are a land trust. They're in charge okay. of the properties. They're part of their mission. Then is to develop those pro properties. Right, so right, that's right. where they'll get into that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Yeah, they're part so of So you would sort of work together with Yeah, them. I work we work with all of them. They're all part of the Trails Club as well. Oh, great. Um, we're oh, all in great. sort of both organizations. And the Trails Club has we have a list of projects ourselves that yeah. um well, that's we had a group from EMC contact us a couple years ago and really? said we're looking for a community project to work on and a crew of five guys came out in the pouring rain and cleaned up all the trails um, down at Berry Acres across from um, Ice House Pond. Really? So that Oh my gosh! Yes, so, I know where that is. Yeah, and so, so where would the parking be for that one? Just oh, that's little... horrible. Right. Yeah, the the parking's just... at the pond, and you have to try to cross that road. Yeah, it's a that's pain. the problem. But the runners love that. They mm -hmm. they run from there to the high school on the right on the trails. That's... So we need an underground tunnel there. Sure. Overpass, <laughs> While we're at it. But that's the thing with the trails. So there, um, the selectmen heard the request um, a couple of months ago uh, from the woman who's in charge of. Um, Jane Morin, who's in charge of the Upper Charles Trail Committee. Mm -hmm. And they said, yes, we, we think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, talk to Norman. Get so that's sort of where things are now that yeah. um, Norman is supposed to put together a gathering of the Trails Committee, um, the Upper Charles Trail Club, 
or the Hopkins Trails Club, mm -hmm. and all the groups that might be interested to say, mm -hmm. what, what should a committee be and who should run it and what should it do? Yeah. That sort of Would thing. Parks and Rec be part of that conversation? Yep. Potentially? They have, we've heard from them that they would like to have an interest in it. Right. Um, other talents, it's the Open Space Committee. Mm -hmm. Um, run it's the a trails committee is kind of a, a subcommittee well, off um, yeah. open space so yeah. each town is a little different okay uh, I think that's really on. exciting you know because yeah. that I think that is one of the assets that we have here mm -hmm. is the ability to have that walkability yeah um, and and connection to nature well, like I say it's a great resource and people just don't know yeah. it's there we'd let a walk at um, uh -huh. the Waseca Wildlife Sanctuary off um, of a week or so ago off of and um, Clinton? Clinton Street and yep. people don't know that we have an Audubon sanctuary here in town and yeah. well again parking you know because it's hard to see when you drive by yeah. there it's oh there's something there I yeah, saw yeah kind of have I to know something. where it is what happened that's a good one so do you does the trails club have any kind of map um, yep. And PR material. Yes, okay. we have. Because I think that would be valuable to on have. The, on the, on, go to the website. Yeah. We have maps. We have information, all sorts of things. Yeah. And one of the things, we held a trail forum um, oh, you did? Uh, last March mm -hmm. where we got just a lot of people came together and said, tell us about trails. What are your concerns? What are, and yeah. one thing that people brought up was maps. Right. Um, That's what I'm saying. The open space does have a map um, book that they put together a couple years ago but it's it's way outdated okay and so um legacy farms pledged seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to the town for trails let's do it so that money is there and we've been trying to figure out what to do with it and one of the things the trails club said was how about we take some of that money hire a professional cartography firm yes. and have them come in and make Yes. Beautiful, yes. nice maps. And interestingly, when we brought that up at that forum, the police and fire department had reps there, and they said, we would love that too. Right. Because if somebody's out in the woods and calls us and says, I'm hurt, or there's a fire, we don't really know where they are. Right, so and the other thing they could do on that map is they could have mile markers yep. and identifying points exactly. of the person. Exactly. I think that's brilliant. Yep. And that would be, okay, so it sounds like the trails are in good shape. Yep. We're trying to make sure that, that, that the rail trail connects through downtown to get the accessibility to businesses. Mm -hmm. We need to have the trails marked out and maps made yep. um, just to make this resource more yeah. accessible, more um, available, yeah. and more um, fully and get people out on the trails. Come on. Informed. You know, yeah, join I'm, the I'm excited come now. Come out on the – join. check with the Trails Club yeah. and come out and walk some of these trails with us. Um, Pay attention to the Upper Charles Trail Committee. I mean, we always, the other comment we get besides, you know, I didn't know about this trail was, how can we get a trail like Milford has? And we tell people there is a group working on it and right. pay attention to them. Right. You know, read their, their meeting minutes, go to their meetings, speak right. up. Um, they need to have some pressure yeah. from the community. Right. Um, and I remember being at it. a conversation and the question was, do we want the paved situation oh, or do we want a more natural uh, mm -hmm. uh, surface and interestingly so. so far of the towns involved mm -hmm. only milford is doing paved holliston yeah i don't love the paved. holliston did all stone dust uh -huh. um hopkinton we are trying to go stone dust um it's permeable if it rains the water goes into I think the trail that's better. much better yeah per so um paved if you go paved you've got now you've got regulations it has to be a certain width yeah. Um, Department of Transportation, you yeah. have to be able to drive an ambulance down it. And puddles and yeah. freezing and, and if you fall, I think it's a yeah. much more teeth breaking situation. So people have opinions both ways. Personally, I and a lot of us would like to have the stone dust trail and not the paved. Yeah. But well, thank you. Glad. I'm so glad you, you shared your thoughts and your expertise. Sure. Um, check out the Upper Charles Rail Trail information and meetings and the uh, Trails Club, and, and thank you so much, and thanks to Lisa Jackson for starting it. We wish she was here, but she's here in spirit. Um, this is why we thought of doing this segment. So um, join us, we're gonna take a break. Join us when we come back, we're gonna talk about the Mass Pike 495 interchange and what the plans are for that. How are things going on the pike? This week on the Golden Pan, Masha, Lisa, and Pat give us a lesson on making potato knockies. 
there's a lot of, everybody that's sweet to own. But I would think once you've made the dough and you're making, you're in that process of making them, I would want to make like a, another one just so I can throw it in the freezer. Exactly. You could either freeze the dough or the, uh, the yucky, right. whatever you want. The, the this week on All About Hopkinton, Mary Arnott introduces us to the new library director, Heather Backman. ...space in what used to be sort of the old circulation area, um, and then we have a classroom downstairs. So um, that's really exciting. We will be permitting um, nonprofit and community organizations to book those. Um, information will be forthcoming sometime in October about that. This week on Wake Up and Smell the Poetry, storyteller Jan Cross Green shares a few stories with the Wake Up crowd. There's so much division. People, people are really divided. Politics is awful. It's a really, really hard time. And she's like, And we're back. Welcome back. We're here to going to talk about the 495-90 interchange project. And I'm doing this because right now <laughs> it comes in here and it goes over there and it goes around here. Yeah. And uh, apparently there have been many accidents. Um, some of the paper says that between 2011 and 2015, how many accidents? 460 it? crashes, including two fatalities. Right, so that's close to 500, mm -hmm. two fatalities. It doesn't look like it should be that fatal a situation. It's just Thanks. roads and they're all supposedly yeah. traveling at reasonable speeds, but yeah, yeah, yeah. they're going to take a look but at it. But it's a lot of weaving and I mean, I used to go through there a lot more often. I do go on there regularly and um, mm -hmm. yeah, getting off and trying to head to 495 South um, it's a lot of crossovers, and there are trucks that are coming off the pike that and need to go north. Care. And yeah, yeah, it's I can see the problems in there. Right. So the merge, and and, and especially if you're not from here, mm. and you're trying to come off the come off the pike to get onto 495, yeah. it is a little confusing. Um, I think there were the toll booths originally mm -hmm. there and that was a different situation yeah. a different design that they had well, you were talking the, about the configuration of the road was dictated by the fact that they had to run everybody through toll booths yeah so they had to cut if you look in there they had to cut out the rock and everything and and put in a toll plaza um, without that barring other issues they they might have gone for just a a classic clover leaf that we all know and love right. on, on major highways that would right. let people just easily flow in and out. But because they had to shunt everybody in there, we wound up with this spaghetti of of uh, crossover. So that's going to be. I noticed. A pain. Um, it is I, well. Um, I did some traveling for the Thanksgiving um, couple of days, and I noticed coming on for, uh, from 495 getting onto the Pike headed westbound, they now have stripes. So the, the mm -hmm. it looks to me like people haven't been able to figure out where the lanes are yeah. because they have the lanes very clearly painted, you know, and even in this kind of um, converging sort of triangle right. and with the with lit up things. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. people don't know where to go. Well, and then, but they clearly didn't. Yeah. That's why, because this is a new thing. So you had to follow this very clearly lined out path yep. to get to the left or the right um, right. on ramp. I do think it's better now without the toll booth because mm -hmm. when the toll booths were there, you you came off the ramps, you came up to the toll booth, so that's one section. Right. And now you're now you have this very short distance to the ramps, and you've got to accelerate out of there, and you've got to cross over six lanes of traffic to get right. where you. Now you've got these long pathways. People have a little bit more time to True. merge and flow. I think it is better, but they can make it better i mean one of the things they want to do is um they want to put in a ramp from 495 north coming up from the cape okay. onto the pike east heading toward boston okay so you would just go in and just go yeah just a right seat, in. a seat a backward yep. seat and there you go you don't have to oh, you know right now you have to do a loop and go down through the former toll plaza place and then yeah, another loop that's crazy. and now you're merging in so they want to do that there's another one they want to do and i forget where 
that I had read about. I don't know what. Mm-hmm. And we were saying they had a meeting here. They, they had two meetings in this area. Yeah. And there was one right at the middle the school. Or the middle school? At the middle school a couple so, weeks ago. I yeah. wanted to go to that. Me too. You had said too, I missed it. If anybody watching yeah. um, went to that, please call in. I'd love to hear what was said there. I looked for um, uh, some notes or news from it afterwards and there was nothing so yep we have yeah, an email actually cool. it says how can they not fix the on and off ramps of 495 onto main street that's very dangerous yeah we're we're kind of glad that they're finally thinking of this um well know? that right now that is not part of the as it, far as i know that is, it's not coming back down to here the, right this they have a picture on here of the project area and it's literally just the 495 so 90. i guess the question is once they attack that part, will they then say, oh, yeah, we have a problem a little further south with the 495 they might. Main Street? Yeah, I um, think, you know, they're going to base it on, as, as we, we pointed out at the beginning, um, yeah. they, they look at number of accidents, number of fatalities, right. where is the most need. Um, I don't know that we've had a lot of, of accidents around here yet that, well, that are, that's going to raise it up to that. Yeah, and, and the thing, too, is... Um, the, the um, statistics they had were from 2011 to 2015. Yeah. Toll booths didn't start getting removed until 2016. True. So those statistics are from when the toll booths were there. And as you're saying, you come through the toll booth and you're over here and you have to go over there. Mm-hmm. And then it depends on who's paying attention or not right. as to how easy that process yeah. is. So it's interesting that they're now addressing the problem and the toll booths aren't there, right. so that the 495 Main Street ramps become a more serious issue mm-hmm. because the toll booths have been taken away. So that seems to alleviate a little bit of that problem. Yeah, they'll have I don't to. Know. It, it's it's going to be a challenge for them because I know that interchange well because I've actually taken a kayak under it. Yeah, um, the Sudbury River mm-hmm. literally goes un- directly under where those two roads cross there right. under a couple of underpasses it's all wetlands um they're going to have a real difficult time just in terms of you know conservation yep there's something in this so. paper on the other side at the bottom oh, yeah. that talked about what did they call the wetlands they have a specific name clear swamp oh uh, uh, cedars well the cedar swamp yes the current interchange abuts on all sides of the cedar swamp area of critical environmental concern they don't um, call the wetlands. It's a cedar swamp area of critical yeah. environmental. Well, it is. Concern. I will say it's an important area because yes. that when that is holding up all the water, um, when it rains really hard, oh. it flows into all that wetlands and doesn't like a just it, yeah, it doesn't come in and flood the Sudbury River. So that's an important mm. area. There's also some archaeological um, interest in there. Like what? To they they found some um, Native American. Yeah, <gasps> cool. Way, way, way back when, so. Uh, and then the other thing it said something about um, it's there are residential neighborhoods. I'm sorry, no, the residential please. neighborhoods there. Sure. There's an active rail line, like you were saying, yep. providing service for MBTA and CSX. Yeah. So um, major commercial pro- properties. So much is happening right in that yeah. interchange area yeah. that um, they're hoping to remove the the bottlenecks um, were part of the toll plaza, but. T- taking those out, they can now design yeah. a more a, a safer, uh, yeah. efficient interchange. There was an article in Hopkinton Independent okay. um, that Michelle Murdoch, the fabulous Michelle Murdoch, wrote about the meeting, okay. which was it says oh, no- yeah November fifteenth, um, first of three planned meetings. So you can go again next okay. time, and um, so it aims to provide safe and efficient interchange. Presentation outlined four separate project needs. One, safety. Two, operations. Three, freight movement. And okay. four, economic development. Sure. Um, the freight movement is important. Because I didn't that, even think of that. Yeah, because that, yeah. that is, we are such a hub here for all the, the trucks that are going, yeah. you know, from western, north. you know, from New York coming up and, and heading yeah. up to New Hampshire, heading right. down. North, um, south, east, west, right yeah, there. They, it's important. You can, for the economic economic good of the the region to make that efficient sure and so she says on average a total of 75,000 vehicles a day use that interchange a hundred thousand vehicles um 
and, and uh, 495 traffic, 110,000 vehicles a day. So mm. that's what's going on those two roads, and then the, just the interchange alone is 75,000. Right. Um, major crossroads for commuters, major point of entry into Massachusetts for truck traffic, with 495 known as the distribution belt. So sure. trucks travel on right. 495 to get to their places where they're distributing things. Um, so there's surveys, traffic studies, project team, environmental notification form has been filed because of what you were saying yeah. with the, um, that area. Um, so the next stops, next steps. Yeah, what's include, the time, the total timeline of this? Um, it says final design and construction to, to 2024, 2025. Wow. So that's- This is a long seven, time. Yeah, seven years. Yeah. Funded partially through transportation improvement hmm. program, additional funds. So. They've got um, a website here, i-495 i-495 slash i-90 interchange improvement project interactive map. Um, yeah. So okay. check out the um, Hopkins and Independent November 23rd issue. I think those are online. Um, some really good information yeah. about how to find out more about that. Um, so you were saying, do you, do you, your proposal would be a clover leaf design? You I, I have no problem. I'm not the. But when you were saying that, that I seems think, to be a more efficient. I think efficient. if they had done, I, I was just thinking one thing. Um, the that interchange is after the the pike was built. Um, uh huh. Hence the the A on the exit name that it's 11A. This was it was an after. I won't say an afterthought, but 495 did not exist when the pike was originally. Put in so this route nine was still there, right? Right. So yeah. that whole interchange was built with an add-on to the pike. They had to figure that oh. it wasn't part of. And if 495 had been there when it was originally go through, going through, mm -hmm. um, would they have done it a little differently? They might have. Uh, and the toll booths complicated things. The toll booths definitely complicated things. So Lisa but, Jackson yeah. says, "Great job, John." Oh, well, thank you, Lisa. And um, I guess you're you're filling her spot pretty sure. well. And um, and then she has a question. What do you think about when there are backups on the highways and people cut through Hopkinton? Mm. Is the town planning for that? Great question. Sure. Yeah, I think I think that really is a concern. It, not only do we have more traffic here now right. because there are more, the town is growing and growing and growing. Mm -hmm. But right, the the trucks now, if they and and with Google Maps and Waze oh, sure. and you know hey here's a free road you can go down boom right. but it's a little road it's a scenic route there's nothing mm -hmm. that says that on ways yeah it says here's a here's a way you can go that's clear right well the, you know we started this by saying the number of accidents up at that interchange and i yeah. know i can think of several times when i've been coming home and been glad that i can get off at our exit because i look up and it's just a parking lot heading Between north us. because there was an accident up by the pike and everybody else in the world is now getting off and heading up into downtown Hopkinton to find a way around. And right, well, it's 135 it's a, yes. and cuts over, yeah. Yeah, and I don't, there isn't much we can do about that. People are going to, Speed bumps. when they get into that, they're gonna put on, <laughs> they're gonna put on their navigation and say, get me home a better way and it's gonna send them right in there. Right. Um, I did hear in the discussion about the downtown and the Main Street corridor project, someone said speed bumps yeah. in the main, and I don't, I don't see that happening. Thank you, no. No, but um, yeah, good question, Lisa. Um, yeah, I don't, there, there isn't a lot you can do, but if, if, if people need to get around there, that's what they're gonna do. They're just gonna take their, their navigation and send them through, but it'd be nice if we had a bypass around the center of town. Right. Um, especially for 135, but yeah, I, I run into that every day. I take 109 into Westwood, and I go through um, Medfield Center itself is one of the worst ones, oh. and it's the same thing. It's a major road. 109 is carrying yes. people, and, and all of a sudden you're going through a little tiny town, right? Which is lots quaint, of stoplights, and right, it's little, nice. Little restaurants. And yeah. we're running into much the same thing here in Hopkinton right. with both morning and evening people coming out of Ashland or heading toward Ashland mm -hmm. and, and uh, backing up. Yeah, and in terms time. of um, town planning, you know, to Lisa's question, you, it's hard, you can't go backwards from mm -hmm. where we are now. I know Weston, I used to live in Weston and the, um, the Boston Post Road bypass, avoid, you know, go straight, yeah. Route 30, 
a 20 goes straight whereas through downtown is this really sweet mm -hmm. little quiet little downtown you mm -hmm. would never know you know looks just this tiny humble mm -hmm. downtown but the bypass is you know sure. so because it's straight and they must have cut through farmland <laughs> before it got developed um and for now for us it's there, I don't know how you would bypass. I think the legacy yeah, this North Road is helpful, but it's not close enough to the center of town. Yeah. Um, what would you think of an off-ramp of 495 at um, Wood Street? Where that crosses there, would that have any value that would let people get off there and head into Woodville and up into Westboro? Um, I think that's right a great idea. Right now, what do they have to do to get, well, West Pro, they'd probably get off at Route 9, but if you're coming up north, mm -hmm. if you're coming up 495 north, you have to go past the, the pike, or you get off in Hopkinton, and you're Absolutely. now you're going on Elm Street and That's all that. That's a great idea. But maybe they could put a, an off-ramp there. I think you should propose that. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. <laughs> this is a good idea. Um, Hopkinton Choir, November 24th issue, also talked about this. Jeff Malakowski. Uh, who's on their staff um, said they came up with three designs to ease traffic but preliminary plans so similar um, similar article to Michelle's um, I don't really see anything new it said something about the project is supposed to cost about 260 million the state has allocated 130 million toward the project as part of the state transportation improvement plan program more funds in future years um, yeah about half the 18-wheelers entering the eastern part of the state use the interchange. Um, so I think I think the trucks alone make it difficult. Sure. Because a truck versus car, yeah. you know, truck may or may not care if they get run into. Yeah. I shouldn't say that, but. No, but, I, but they have a job to do. I mean, I remember when I would go through that interchange if i saw a, t a tractor trailer trying to move over <laughs> i would let him exactly go and it's not you know for fear of Big my dog. life but it's like you know this is your yeah, job right. you're exactly. i'll give you a break let him in right yeah. i agree with so, you um so some of the traffic volume details again with jeff malakowski and the um town crier Seventy-five thousand vehicles 100,000 vehicles per day on the pike 110,000 vehicles on the 495 half of the trucks enter eastern mass on the 495 Pike interchange, um, and again the number of crashes with two fatalities. I just remembered. I think, I think I may have remembered one of the other um, things they were talking about with the ramps was um, a dedicated ramp from um, the Pike eastbound onto 495 South. So basically, I'll call it the Cape Cod ramp. Separate from. Yeah. That would be smart. You know, because there is so much, tra there, there are the signs on the pike in the summertime that say, you know, watch out for stop traffic because it is so many yeah. um, people trying to get down to the Cape. Right. And if they could separate those lanes out a little bit, you're still going to have some people that are going to want to cross over and not, you know, and certainly let people, people going to New early Hampshire. enough. Yeah, but that just they, say. They, they don't say, oh my gosh, I have to go. Yeah, if you're going Cape Cod, get here. If yeah. you're going New Hampshire, get here. And this other lane is for you that can't make up your mind until or don't quite know <laughs> where you're going. So yeah. better signage is a good idea. Yep. Yep. Um, and the other thought in terms of the tolls um, and the easy pass situation. Mm. Um, so is you it ha easier? Do you have an easy pass? I have an easy pass. Okay. A transponder. Okay. And um, I I don't want to be billed for that. Mm -hmm. I want to pay them okay. when I remember that my balance runs out. But I don't always remember because I'm not on the pike sure. all the time. So I just went to visit my sister in New York over there and my um, my daughter and everything. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, my balance was apparently in the caution zone. Uh oh. So I went through one, and then the second one said, "Call Easy Pass," and I called, yeah. and I thought I put the money on the card, and I went through the whole thing, and then lo and behold, no, it didn't. <laughs> it pushed me back out. So I think I think the system, the Easy Pass system, is convenient in a one way, yeah. um, or some way, but it's it is also a little bit of a challenge in terms of yeah. to get to a physical place to pay the bill. Sure. You have to get on the pike. And pay it in, um, where is that, Weston, or somewhere okay. on the pike. There's a 
place where you can pay your okay i don't jack, know you know put the money yeah on i'm the, on the automatic withdrawal yeah, it just no, to physically pay it you either wow. they now have automatic you can put it on the credit card on the phone mm -hmm. or you go physically to the place on the pike okay. at the restaurant okay. um eastbound on the right side sure, i think the rest it's west area. End. yeah i know yeah. i think another one um and the other thing is when they put the pike in and they said okay everyone has to get oh, a yeah. transponder then in two, so that was in 2015 everyone's on this system and we'll pay by plate don't worry about it 2017 may pay for plate surcharge to begin tuesday mm. so initially when they started this they didn't say there's a surcharge right. so people who didn't have a transponder thought oh, okay sure you'll just bill me mm -hmm. but then it got to um the transponder so here an article um talking about mass dot if you take um, Westfield exit five to Chicopee, whatever. So cost 30, 30 cents, but a pay by plate will pay for 65 sure. cents for the same trip, mm -hmm. which is double. And then trip from Lee to exit seven in Ludlow, easy pass $1.30, same trip, pay by plate $2.10. Yeah. So, so, you know. Yeah, they're covering their costs. Uh, they, there is a certain amount of, of yeah. those plates that they are never gonna collect. Um, they aren't going to get that money, and uh, and there are processing fees and such. Yeah. It costs more to process. Easy Pass, they know they have the money um, in hand, it's so true. They, so really they do have to do that, and they want to encourage people. I mean, I've had Easy Pass forever. I I actually got mine out, out of New Jersey originally, and been using it. And we use it all over New England. We go, and I've gone down to Pennsylvania, and it works there. It yeah. works in Maine. I'll be up in Maine this weekend. It'll get me through New Hampshire and Maine there so I and that's relatively new I like it how, how recently did they switch us to the easy pass was that the same time uh, 2015 well, Ma Massachusetts was fast lane first oh they, that's right they they decided they weren't going to do what everybody else did and of they course. would come up with their entire their own new system but mm -hmm. um and then they finally switched over easy pass I think that was probably four or five years ago now mm -hmm. but fast lane's right been on for a yeah, while yeah yeah so Easy Pass, it's it it's a good system. Yeah. Um, my other question is, where where are they taking those pictures? They have sixteen gantries. Are those yep. those tall things? Yep. And then they have all those. Yep. Cameras so when you on. go, you can actually see a little flash. There's a, a light that a little strobe light that's illuminating your your uh, your license plate, and they've In a the bunch dark? of cameras. Yeah. So. Oh, the technology for image processing is is. That's what I wanted to say because they would have to take an image at 60 miles an hour or whatever oh, yeah. that's, speed that's and trivial. they would have to get each individual yep. vehicle yep. and the, and they'd have to be able to take it at such an angle or such a clarity that would yep. get them the image and that they And believe it or need. not that that is not the a big problem. That's amazing. The to technology me. to do that is is to me it's more the idea that I can drive through it at 60 miles an hour and it'll pick up my easy pass. That amazes me more than the photographer. I remember the first time we ran into one of those um, I, I'm, again, I think it was done in New Jersey, and I was um, just amazed. It's like, I can just keep driving? This is so cool. So, so the Easy Pass, and this is a little bit um, of a sidetrack. Sure. So if you were lost, mm -hmm. if someone was trying to find you, mm -hmm. and you were in a car accident, they could actually find your car by no. your Easy Pass. They nope. couldn't. Nope. Easy oh. Pass, easy, no. Easy Pass goes when you go under a gantry. It, okay. It, the so gantry, is, the gantry is easy pass is passive. It's not sending out a signal. Okay. Something has to query it. So the gantry is sending a signal down that Are excites. Are you an engineer? Yes. Cool. And it excites your easy pass, and your easy pass fires back and says, "I'm number I'm here. blah 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 blah," uh, and okay. it says, "Oh, we know that number, and uh, thank you. You're now I giving us thirty cents." So. Okay. And so people are worried about that. People, you know, yeah. I know people that will not get Easy Pass because oh, it's Big Brother and it's tracking me. And yes, it's tracking you as you go along the pike, and it knows that you're at this. And people are worried about speeding. That oh. it, no, they say you know if but it's if, not if I go through the, for if, that. no, but the, you know, that's one of the concerns. I go through this gantry, and then I go through this gantry, and the turnpike knows how far apart those gantries are. And if you're doing them in 10 minutes and it should be taking you 20 minutes, they know you're speeding. But they, there are all sorts of safeguards that prohibit them from using it for that. Yep. Well, I think we could talk a long Forever. time about that because that's so fascinating to me. And I, and I think those are questions inquiring minds want to know. Are we being tracked or no? You're saying it just 
it, it's just registering for that moment yep. for that only purpose. That's it. It could be expanded to other purposes in the future. Who knows? But at this point, it seems to be just doing that thing. That's it. Okay, so we're gonna take a break. We're gonna come back and talk about North Korea. What should our response be? And um, should we make nice or should we uh, not be so nice? Or just send Dennis Rodman. Please feel free to call in. All the information is on the screen and we will look forward to talking with you soon. So we actually this week on HKM TV, EHOP presents a spotlight on the town fields. It just was a really nice moment when the kids came out of the woods and were running. Literally, practice stopped, and all of the kids, uh, the soccer kids, stopped and we were cheering for the middle schoolers running in the cross country course. And that's really, um, you know, it was, it was just a wonderful moment for all the kids to be supporting each other out here. Uh, guys. I'm Haley. Hi, Ray Davis. Jake. We're the Hiller Volleyball Team. My name is Emma. My name is May. <laughs> my name is Shelby. My name is Sophie. We're Al and Gal, and we love HCAMP. Hey, I watch TV. Uh, camp. We love, love HCAMP. And I volunteer for HCAMP TV. And I watch HCAMP TV. And I love HCAMP TV. And I love HCAMP TV. We, we love HCAMP TV. This week on HKM Television, attorney Arthur Bergeron visits the Hopkins Senior Center and delivers a talk about honoring the choices. The doctor has determined in writing that you're incapable of making a medical decision. So right now you're on the floor, you don't look like you're capable of making a medical decision, but a doctor has not determined in writing that you're incapable of making a medical decision. So as far as the EMT is concerned, they're following the most form. And we're back. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so, uh, North so what Korea. Are we about? Okay. What is happening there? They're firing missiles. Yes, they are. Are they doing it just to be provocative? That, yeah. You know, the last one I, I was saying before that I was, uh, um, I was doubting the initial reports. I thought they had typos because they said it went almost three thousand miles. Crazy. Up and I, yep. I thought that had to be that couldn't be right, but um, yeah. Crazy, yeah. So I, I don't think you can see this, but um, this is from um, CNN. Had a picture on their on their. I looked, you know, today t today's report. The most important things to know: one, the NIP missile is named Hwasong 15. <laughs> okay. It's a new type of ICBM, Intercontinental Ballistic Mister Missile, an upgrade of Hwasong 14. Okay. Fired 3 a.m. local time, their time, Wednesday, from a mobile launcher in Pyongsong, North Pyongan Peninsula, reached a height of 2,800 miles, wow. higher than ever before. So not only are they not deterred, by whatever threats our government has been making, they're just continuing and, and ex, you know, improving on what they made of its improvement. It splashed down off the Japanese coast within the country's exclusive economic zone. That's South a Korea, concern. Yes, South Korea responded with a precision missile strike drill. Hmm. So time of the year was 53 minutes. It went for a distance of 950 kilometers. Um, yeah, so it went and it way splashed down off of Japan. Yeah. So if it's in its exclusive economic zone, has it already done damage to animals and? Well, I don't know that it's animals, but it's in life basically in it's in Japan's territory, mm -hmm. and you know that that's a provocation right there. That yeah. you know if they had, it's bad enough they did it at all, right. um, but if they had landed it out in international waters, they could just say we're just. Testing. showing off and testing but because it landed in Japanese territory now you're violating Japan's um, Exclusive sovereignty. Exclusive economic so. zone. So it's, it, it sounds to me, I mean I hope this isn't true, but if it's called an economic zone does that mean that that's a place that their economy depends on yep. as don't. in fish because I know the sushi is, sure. you know, I just, I'm just, yeah, I don't know I'm what so I don't know what the economic zone, whether that's yeah. shipping lanes or I fishing. Don't know. If someone knows what an economic zone is, please let us yeah. know. Um, North Korea broke a two month lull in weapons testing with a dramatic launch of its most advanced missile yet. Why 
would they do this? They haven't done anything since September 15th. Well, they, they seem to be you know, watching the political winds of the world, and these are timed mm. very carefully in the past to respond or to you know, make a show and let someone know that we're still here, or maybe we're, people started to forget about them, they thought. So, yeah, I don't know what this latest one was. I personally find it amazing that they are able to develop this kind of technology given their economic circumstances. They are, we have so many sanctions on them, their people are starving, they're getting embargoed, there's nothing going in, and there's finding the money um, to develop this this kind so of they're technology. Getting this outside is not cheap support. technology. They're getting outside support, okay. perhaps, in my humble opinion, because it sounds to me like they're, if their economy isn't strong, although they do have car manufacturing and they have computer technology manufacturing. S some. some. South Korea definitely is doing the cars. I don't oh, know about okay. North Korea. Oh. North Korea, is, and I think what they're doing is they're just shifting their money where it needs, where they want it to go. So yes, they'll starve their people, but they'll put a ton of money into um, the president's palaces and into you know this missile program because this is important for them yeah, for their, they need to their prestige and their their perception of themselves. Up of yeah. So Lisa Jackson has contacted us remotely, and she we should be on this show. She is awesome. She's here in spirit and, and on our, our Facebook sure. here. So Lisa said, a special economic zone is an area in which business and trade laws are different from the rest of the country. Okay. Um, located within a country's national borders and their aims include increased trade, increased investment, job creation, and effective administration. So this... Okay, so that's out in the middle of the ocean where well, this Well, that's it. So the so specific not... terminology for this said exclusive economic zone. So hmm. I'm not sure if that's the same. Right. Um, and then Lisa says, it's very concerning that North Korea is showing that their missile range can reach the United States. Oh, absolutely. And worried that the current administration isn't working on more diplomatic resolutions, and this may lead to military action, yeah. undoubtedly. Yeah, well, we have a certain amount of, they're being belligerent, we're right, being Lisa. belligerent, you know, and the, so is this the point where, ch where we push on China to step in and well i think we've been asking and for be the ones to, from china to push on it right but china's not feeling threatened by this so do they have do they have any reason that they would want to to know. do this um certainly having a nuclear war on their doorstep is not going to be anything they'd be interested in but um right there isn't it doesn't seem to be a compelling reason right now for china other than to advance china's n international standing as you know now it used to be the united states were the peacemakers and maybe china is now going to start to move into that role i don't know there's one thing that's interesting here um in the washington post article today mm -hmm. by adam taylor um saying that the question was why would they launch in the middle of a bitterly cold night why would they pick mm. that time so his conjecture is interesting. yeah his his conjecture is that um there have been a variety of tests at different times and then no one knows why they spread out the missile testing, but the best guess by someone at the James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies, Proliferation Studies, um, if something goes wrong, they have a full day to try to make it right and, and make it work. I was son, just gonna say. <laughs> really? Because, you know, yeah, if, if, if it's a failure launch that doesn't look good, you wanna, you don't Come. wanna, yeah. Not so obvious in the middle of the night. If nothing happened, then sure. people wouldn't know, maybe. No, that makes so, sense. So then this says, nighttime launches seem less logical. Working in the dark or the cold is not ideal, but these late tests may serve a broader strategy. Instead, showing that North Korea can launch a missile anytime and anywhere sure. with little warning, yeah. as it would in a real wartime scenario. Um, yeah. A little scary. And because of that, the height they were able to hit, uh. you know, it, it basically went up and came right down. It, it, Big arc. Yeah, um, but March. you just angle it a little bit now, and it goes, instead of it's straight up, distance. it's going out, and now mm -hmm. they're saying they literally could hit any place in the United States. So at least, um, you know, University of Hawaii doesn't have to be quite as worried anymore because they probably, if they're going to attack the United States, they're probably going to go after a bigger target True. than, they would go over than Hawaii. Hawaii. So this is, um, so another thing, they're also 
could have, thinking the timing was deliberately designed to surprise the neighbors and show how unpredictable they could be. Well, we kind of um, know they're being predicted. Obscure the final sure. launch prep from overhead surveillance and maximize surprise. So if they're, mm. if it's a 3 a.m. launch, they start preparing at dark, dusk. Yeah. You know, then they no one can see it, and then they let it go. Um, more worrying still, appear designed to goad U.S. De missile defense systems. Um, U.S. primary system for defending the country from North Bal Korean ballistic missile is a ground-based mid-core system mostly based in Alaska and partially California. Mm. Never uh, Has never been successfully intercept tested at night. Mm. So, so yeah, they, they were, never they were tested testing, our, testing our defenses to see how we would react. Right. Oh, that, I missed something. I can see that. So I just missed one thing. Uh, oh, no, I hear it. So there's a comment. Um, James says... I think if everyone ignored him, Kim Jong-un would be much less provocative. The media elevates his profile by continually freaking out about it. I don't think it helps. I totally agree, James. Thanks for contacting. Mm -hmm. I totally agree, and I think that our commander-in-chief um, exacerbates the situation because they're all, you know, threatening this and, yeah. and getting mad about that. Um, so Lisa... Thank you, Lisa. Checked on an exclusive economic zone is a C zone prescribed by United States Conve United Nations Convention okay. on the Law of the Sea, over which a state has special rights regarding exploration and use of marine resources, okay. so including energy production from water and wind. So sure. it is a zone that Japan relies on for its ec economy. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that it's it's their territory. Right. Yeah, I you know I don't know about. Um, leaving, leaving Kim Jong Un um, alone and ignore him is. Yeah, I think he. he I think if he feels ignored, he's going to just make bigger just noise. Just make more but fuss. I, well, they. Yeah. I think they're they're a tiny nation, tiny island, and they need to. They they're trying to stay safe themselves. Um, uh, so we have about one minute. Okay. And um, do we have? What are our thoughts? Should we just blast them out of the water? I, you know, I. Uh, no. Because Not then you disrupt the but you don't want to, you know, you, you almost want to say, okay, let's work with them and see if we can diffuse it with working with them. But you don't want to reward them, given all what they've done to their people. Yeah, um, it's a problem. So right. So what do you guys think? Something to think about, maybe revisit in the future. And we really appreciate your joining us. Thank you.